Hey, Damien. Hello there. Hello, Hello there. You? It's great to have you on board for this um, little event. Thank you for, for joining in. Absolutely. It's an honor and um, I'm so happy to be talking to you about technology, future and everything. So yeah, let's do it. Well, um, it's the second uh, cast that we do actually. So, and the idea is always to, you know, to look for um, people who do very interesting things in, in our wider industry. Um, so we're talking to, uh, planning to talk to recording artists, to sound um, designers, to people who, um, uh, who work in other fields of, of, uh, of the industry where speakers and headphones and um, gear is uh, <laughs> an essential part. And um, our common uh, friend, Chris Parkinson, actually introduced us, I think, um, a while ago. Um, and uh, it really caught my attention because I saw that you have actually a background in um, not just in recording, but with a specific uh, focus on uh, recording um, classical music, orchestras, chamber music, and uh, in a way that's that's of a very special interest for me, uh, for, for my own background. And uh, that's why I, th I thought I'd invite you over to to talk to me a little bit about this kind of stuff. Um, from what I understand, you you are you founded two companies actually one is called the mono company and the other one i think is called sound x absolutely and i would love to hear a little bit more about that and maybe you could could give us a, a little context about you and also yeah. the companies that you run of course of course um well it all started no, uh, <laughs> well actually yeah it, it all started when i was as a kid, um, recording my sister, actually, who was a wonderful mezzo-soprano, and I was so fascinated by, you know, how it all sounded and everything. So as soon as I was like, you know, 10, 11, I started recording a few things here and there. Then I started uh, mechanical and aerospatial studies uh, for three years, but I was still uh, recording things all the time. And after three years, um, I, I decided to go a bit more into the sound engineering domain because I love equations, I love math, I love science, um, but I needed something a bit uh, more applied, you know, and, and the application for me was evident that it should be sound and I love sound in whatever form or shape. Uh, and so I, I really wanted to try to explore that domain. So I, I started in a, in a, um, a French studio uh, specialized in classical music. And uh, I, I started obviously doing small little things here and there uh, until I think three, four weeks after my arrival. And I, I honestly didn't know much about classical sound engineering and how to edit and how to, you know, work with artists. Um, there's this amazing conductor that's called Theodore Kurensis mm -hmm. that came work with us in the studio and the boss came into the studio all sweating and panicked uh, on a Saturday morning when I came just to do some backups and finish a, a small little project that they gave me. And it turns out the engineer that was working with Theodore did a burnout and there was nobody left but me in my small little cave working on my small PC computer. And uh, he was like, there's nobody else. Like, can you do it? I was like, sure. <laughs> you know, are you ready? Sure. I wasn't ready, <laughs> but, you know, and, and we quickly started working together and, uh, a, a few days later, he, he called Sony so that I, I would be uh, his engineer on, on all of his productions. And uh, so that's how I started get, getting into the, the high level of classical music. Um, I, it, it was obviously a huge part of luck and also a, a huge part of, of hard work, too, because I had to accelerate the, the learning curve mm. like times. You know, it, it was exponential, you know. Um, so then on, I got um, different types of productions that were given to me. I remastered the early works of Craig Leon. Oh. I, I, I started working with uh, Barbara Hendricks. So th there were many different types of artists that were starting to, to work with. And it, it was so interesting, uh, the difference that these artists, you know, wanted and, you know, how we could shape their sound, their production and their artistic intention. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely fascinating yeah, yeah. Um, and and so I, I was later on asked to to do the Olympic Games opening ceremony if uh, back in 2015 2016 mm -hmm. it was the first European Games so 
it was a big deal at that time. And I was only 23 when they asked me to, to lead the, the productions for, for everything Sonic. So oh. we recorded in uh, the Funk House in Berlin, oh, cool. which I absolutely adore. It's yeah, my it's favorite place to record. Crazy in. special place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. It, it's so German. <laughs> yeah. uh, and yeah. at the same time, it, it's so everything, you know. And, and yeah. when you sit down in the recording hall where you have where the public is supposed to be, mm. it sounds terrible. It sounds awful. Mm. But everything is built so that it would sound good for the main mic that you put for the recording. Ah, okay. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, we could talk about recording techniques a bit later on, but yeah. that, that changes everything. Yeah. And so we recorded all the sounds for the, the Olympic ceremony over there. And then we went to, to Baku to to work with different artists, like um, uh, like different local artists, mm -hmm. uh, different classical international artists, and some pop artists like Lady Gaga, for example, that came to mm -hmm. uh, do Imagine um, from John Lennon. And so um, once this was all over, um, I, I got a call a few months later to... to tell me that I was nominated for an Emmy mm -hmm. and um, which I won and I was super surprised because you know what the fuck mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah yeah and 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 once I I had this I was I was able to to create my first company uh, because I wanted to do things a bit different mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted in some sense to be able to innovate constantly uh, because I did feel the limitations of what we were working with sonically, in terms of gear, in terms of algorithms. And I was like, okay, it's if I want to do something different, I have to do it myself mm. and, and try to get amazing people, amazing brands to also be able to support me and the efforts that we're doing in that sense. So the Mono Company was created and... Uh, we, we kept on producing many, many different things from the sonar in Barcelona to special artists like Arca. Uh, we worked with Brian Eno. We worked with a bunch of different people that kind of diversify mm -hmm. uh, the context of, of what we're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, well, that's for the Mono Company. We can talk about the rest <laughs> later on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> so many questions raised, actually. Um, no, I mean that that's that's really great. Um, so if you if you, uh, I'm actually interested in both. I'm I'm interested in in finding out, um, you know, what is involved and what it is like to actually uh, work with a live orchestra, uh, because I mean there's much more to it than just a technical understanding and the complexity of microphone techniques and complexity of recording. But there's also obviously like a psychological aspect to it when you actually work with people in the moment and there's no time and no patience to, to you know, like, like it would be probably in post-production. Uh, working with conductors, working with uh, egos um, must must be something you have to handle as well. Um, oh, definitely. Is there also score reading skills involved? Uh, because um, from from what what I hear, it's in in Germany you have this this profession called the Tonmeister, which is yes. in a way the highest honor you know for a sound engineer because you need to play an instrument, you need to have a very good understanding of music theory. And uh, actually following up with scores when people play uh, is a pretty important part of the recording process as well. Is this something you've um, experienced yourself when you're out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you do classical recording, um, let's say at uh, a high level, uh, you have to be able to, to read the score. And little by little, I, I also learned to be a, a tone meister and... In 95% of my productions, I have to be the tone meister because for me, recording classical music is not only um, directing how the general sound is, but it's also to be able to direct the conductor in the specific sense that we have a better listening experience than he does because we have, you know, different positions that, that we can carry on a bit more over and we have, in some sense, more preciseness out of the sound. So we have to mm. be the second ears. And we have to be able to direct the conductor saying, oh, yeah, yeah. bar four, the bassoon, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so, yes, I, I, I do have to be a tone master. It's super enjoyable because uh, the, the stress, you know, that you have and the pressure that you have related to 
directing 150 musicians at the same time. Uh, it, it's something that you feel very, very rarely. But when you do it, the, it, it it's fantastic. And, yeah, and I yeah. have the the perfect example of this pressure because you, you arrive in this hall or whatever recording studio and um, most of the time you don't really have a lot of time to set up the microphones. Now I, I always kind of try to come one, sometimes maybe, maybe two days in advance when we have very specific uh, productions to do. But most of the time we have to arrive a few hours before the musicians come. Mm -hmm. And so we have to put all the microphones uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 you know, put the recording interface here and there, get the regie ready. And uh, once we do that, and once we start, you know, finally plug in the final microphones, all the musicians usually arrive at that moment. And it creates a huge chaos, exactly like in the movies where you're trying to, you know, with the talkie walkie, so are you getting my line, et cetera, et cetera. And you hear all the musicians tuning at the same time. And it kind of creates this horrible chaos which i love because it, it's you know it's like you know sounds yeah, coming from everywhere yeah, totally love that yeah, too. it's just yeah. so it's just turning and turning and turning and yeah. you're like okay i have to do a good job and quickly yeah and yeah. so so that that's a great thing then on the directing is definitely another thing when depends on the artists um some artists love to be uh in some ways followed a lot like Every take, you say, okay, this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong, this was amazing, keep on doing that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And with some artists, um, you feel that you can just let them be. And you have to protect the integrity of their work, and, and they have to be able to create a loan in some sense. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're writing everything on your side, and maybe an hour or two later, uh, later you can come back on it. But mo sometimes they just need to be cocooned in a safe space mm. and that's what also we have to we have to do yeah 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 but yeah, but it's 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 mm. a very sorry it, it's a very different thing to record obviously pop and and or orchestral recordings yeah of course in terms mm. of you know placement and there's a certain philosophy uh that we have here at the mono company mm -hmm. and there's a reason why it's called the mono company it's because mm -hmm. i I worked a lot with so what you see behind the the, the fancy speakers and everything it's mm -hmm. it's uh, audio notes yeah, um, yeah. It, it's it was one of my favorite brand, brands from always because it, it's such a, a precise hi-fi brand and I was lucky enough to meet Peter Quotrup the, the the CEO of audio note during one of my recordings and he was fascinated by by the type of work we were trying to do mm. and he was like so how could we work together and so we we designed the first uh, Atmos system with uh, uh, audio note technology, mm -hmm. which is such an honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working together for like seven years now. Um, and and Peter showed me he 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 wanted me to come to Brighton, and and he played me. He has like two hundred thousand records, LPs. It's insane. And and when you go over there, he he shows you the most amazing mono recordings from mm -hmm. the 50s and mm -hmm. 60s. Yeah. And when I listened to those, I was like, is this stereo or mono or mm -hmm. surround? And he was like, this is mono. I could mm -hmm. not believe it. Mm -hmm. And and I was so fascinated since then of, with, with the mono sounds. And I was yeah. like, yeah. if people did with just one channel, what even nowadays we cannot do with 124 channels, mm -hmm. like... Something's wrong there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? But how does that, f like, um, I mean, if this is sort of a philosophy or sort of a foundation for, for your work, how does that, um, how how do you approach it when you're, I mean, you're traveling to a different city, you're in a concert hall that you have probably never stepped in before and you want to apply your, um, you know, aesthetic uh, to to the whole project Um without having to to uh, take your entire studio all around the world all the time like how how does that workflow actually function well it, for me it's pretty simple in, in in some ways because i base everything on simplicity uh for yeah. me less is definitely more mm -hmm. and uh, i mean you could say i'm super lazy uh because 90 95 percent of my sound is based on two microphones. That's it. Whether we have 
one solo artist or 150 musicians playing, I don't know, Beethoven ninth or something, like it's 95% of the sound comes from two microphones. So mm -hmm. just imagine some ears, a few meters on top of the, the conductor. And this is where I place my, my two main microphones. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get a general picture of how the orchestra should be. So I place my microphones and I go listen and we ask the different parts of the orchestra to play to see if we move chairs around so that they could fit a bit more or if we, you know, put the, the, the main pair a bit down and up, etc. Once we have the sweet spot, then everything gets easier. Mm. We put some spot mics here and there just in case mm -hmm. because we might want, you know, more contrabass. We might want to put the sound in Atmos. So it, it's kind of a security for us, which we mm. do. Yeah. Um, but generally, it's just two microphones. So it, it, there's obviously a work of adaptation mm. uh, with the space that we work in. Sometimes we have to put drapes everywhere. Course, Sometimes yeah. we have to remove yeah. the seats. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we have to do crazy things, work with the air conditioning, the humidity, because everything yeah. changes, yeah. like, uh, especially with old um, strings that they could use, you know, mm -hmm. gut strings for Baroque music or something. So yeah. Yeah. everything yeah. has to be calculated in some ways. But if you base your philosophy on something that is so pure and simple as basically a second pair of ears mm. on top of the conductor, mm. You can't really go wrong mm, uh, mm. Wh when you do your sound. So base everything on simplicity, mm. uh, and, and then everything gets easier. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's interesting. So, so is is this usually the same kind of mic that you use? If, is that part of the sonic imprint of productions that come from the Mono Company, or um, can, can you maybe elaborate on the actual recording? Um, a process like what microphones what the, what's the conversion yeah. and yeah. Uh, how does the post-production uh, work because I, I imagine that there is a lot of post uh, involved as well lots of editing I mean I've I know that from from it's always fascinating to me if you listen to classical music recordings and you know how the process of recording actually took place I, I know that from from uh, Berlin I've witnessed a lot of uh, recording situations myself in the classical music realm. Um, the last or the most memorable for me was actually recording um, Piano Etudes by uh, Ligeti. Mm -hmm. And this is crazy complex uh, piano music that kind of flows from the beginning to the end. There are no, no real breaks. Everything is kind of um, uh, in, in, in one big, big flow that gets more and more complex and and mostly ends up very abrupt and those etudes were written between um 1985 i think the earliest to to the early 2000s and uh, even there um the editing process is so complex and there's so much cutting involved and so much uh, tedious uh, editing work even uh, and, and you just don't hear it in the music the music really comes across as a whole but the art of editing is is no nowhere it seems to be as complex as in in the in the field of classical music. So um, it would be interesting for me to to hear you know from the start to the end like how how you approach things and what gear and what software is involved as well. I think that's probably also really oh, yeah. interesting for a few folks out there. Yeah, for sure. So the full line, um, all my secrets. So it, it's I, I'm <laughs> I'm completely open with what I work with because I I do believe that it, it's. I'm a gear stud. Like everything that concerns gear, I'm like, I need it. I want it. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a bad thing, <laughs> but <laughs> who, you know, who cares? Um, okay, so when I go on location recordings or when I go onto different studios, I always take my own gear with me. Okay. Um, so the main interface that we use is a DAD AX32. Oh, yeah. Or two. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, when we need them. Uh, for those who don't know it, they probably might know the MTRX from Avid. The mm -hmm. MTRX is basically a DAD X32 that's painted black. Uh, Avid saw that uh, NTP was doing amazing work and they just said, let's have this and let's paint it black and make it a bit, you know, maybe a bit more uh, better looking. You know? Is that Dante-based actually? It's Dante-based. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so we're we're definitely working with Dante on most of our yeah. uh, field or, or studio recordings. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's kind of the universal, you know, yeah. networking yeah. thingy. So yeah. we work with it a lot. Um, the conversion of the DAD is amazing. I, I worked for years and years with uh, the best of other firms like Merging uh, Technologies yeah. and yeah. their Horus or Happy uh, yeah. interfaces. And yeah. they're okay, but there is something... I don't. There's something I, I've over the years I've put my finger on with merging is that when they do conversion, because it's like quartz based. Uh, like I, I do feel the quartz. You know, like everything is so mellow and so beautiful. But I don't need when I'm recording some something for a, a recording interface to come put a huge, um, you know, a, kind of a huge sound of you know, melancholia and, and you know, <laughs> dramaturgy. You know, I don't want this. I want, like, I record the sound, I want it super honest mm. and I want it super straight. And mm. I was working with the DAD AX24, but it, it wasn't really an interface. It was just preamps. And I was mm. like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Mm. And when the, the AX32 got out, I was like, I, I need this this piece. So this is my go-to machine. It, it's right there. Yeah. Um, I use it for mastering, mixing, and editing and recording. So it's a, it's kind of my go-to tool, um, and it also works a lot for me when we produce festivals and we have to acquire, mm. you know, MADI signals yeah. and and stuff like yeah, that. So that's right. the that's for the recording side. Um, if we want to get super nerdy, then you know we we developed um, pure silver cables with audio notes, mm -hmm. and uh, the silver cables go with the the main microphones that we use. Mm -hmm. It changes so much, uh, you know, it clears everything up. Um, and so this is this is the type of cable I use. If I'm not using these silver, silver cables, I use Mogami cables mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I mean, I, I I try not to be a snob about things because I honestly believe that if the musician is great and if as an engineer you're good enough, you can have a Grammy winning CD, CD with the shittiest cable, the you know, the worst microphone ever, mm. and and uh, even if you're recording at 44.1 and and 16 bit, yeah, you know, I tend to agree. Yeah, no. yeah, you know, all of this extra fanciness for me is maybe a way to because we can try to push forward uh, the sound uh, in general, mm. but it doesn't change that craftsmanship, and and most important of all the the beauty of the musician as an you know as a craftsman or a craftswoman also is is so important it's 99 percent of the sound mm. and the the, the one percent sure it's the fancy microphones it's the fancy cables and i, I i'm a firm believer in that 100 yeah. percent yeah. yeah so yeah and, and so after with to, to to answer your question um once we have everything in the box, once we've recorded with our microphones, our cables, our interface, we change the software depending on the type of music, actually. So if it's something a bit more rock, we're going to go with Pro Tools. Uh, if it's something that's classical, we're definitely going to record with Pyramix, uh, which is honestly one of the best sounding software that, yeah. that is out there. The algorithms that they have are fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and the editing capacities are amazing too. The, the yeah. source destination uh, is great. Uh, so basically what is source destination is when you do recording, imagine you have 30 tracks and you can just push a button and just it renders them into just one. And then you can add, you know, 16 of these same things to record um, it's kind of a playlist situation that you have in Pro Tools. Yeah. Okay. But mm. the the editing capacities are are much much more developed. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. have kind of a love and hate relationship with uh, Pyramix um, because it's it's one of the software I use the most, but it's it's the software I hate the most mm -hmm. because it's still only on PC, and it's just this year in 2020 that merging enabled multi-threading. Mm -hmm. So before you couldn't even use, everything was condensed into one core. Exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, like this is terrible. Yeah. So yeah, yeah so we use Pyramix for, yeah, for edi great. editing. Yeah. And
Yeah, I guess that's that's kind of a it's not, I wouldn't call it a standard, but it's definitely you see it among classical music engineers a lot. Um, um, I think they use it in you know, the Emil Berliner Studios also in Berlin, which is one of the oldest studios in in, in Germany for this, and they yep. also do a lot of location recording actually. Um, and um, yeah, I mean. I, I do have emerging um, Anubis at home. Actually, this was uh -huh. my my latest. This was my twenty my two thousand nineteen gear fever moment was that I really wanted to <laughs> to to own this, and so I replaced like a basic um, audio interface with it uh, at home to have like a very um, simple working setup. And despite the the fact that the the setup and you know the the there's a certain quirkiness to it when you when you set it up and when you know it's it's not really plug and play it's kind of the opposite of plug and play but everything else uh, i think is is really great on that on that device uh, including the haptics and the way it's built yes. and you know it's just an overall positive experience um but you need to be ready to invest a little more in understanding how it works and to set it up properly and to configure it to 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 yep. your own needs that that's it's not like a universal audio interface or an apogee interface that just you know needs usb port and then you're good to go yeah oh yeah i mean it's, it's kind of i mean it's a good segue to talking about graphic design within mm -hmm. sound engineering world because when when you work with paramix uh you're working in the middle ages i mean every year they <laughs> maybe try to do a different interface but it looks horrible mm. and when you go on mac and you open logic everything is so clear everything is amazing and so we're we want to put everything on logic all of our productions because the the experts algorithms are excellent mm. it wasn't the case before but now pro tools and uh, pro tools always had like a in the past years when you compared and that's my just personal opinion but when you were comparing paramix which was so pristine to the experts that pro tools were doing pro tools were like playing with an old Gibson, you know, it's, it's super round, you know, and it's super mellow and, and on the opposite Cubase was more like a fender, you know, super tight and maybe a bit too tight. And so Permix was always in between in terms of, um, bounces and, and experts, but now logic is, is I'm really blown away by, by what they did in the recent years and also Pro Tools, they removed the, the mellow side of, of the experts. So if you if you're so um, aware and informed um, from your own listening experience as well, um, when it comes to classical recording aesthetics and recording in mono, and you you have all this kind of spirit, and you're connected to that time and to the early you know kind of foundational years of of the recording industry after the, the war, it's is that something that leads you also towards uh, restoration work? Because I mean, I feel that with your skill set and with the listening skills that you have, uh, it would be a natural thing to do for you as well to do restoration work, to offer restoration work to to your clients. Yeah, we we did some uh, restoration work mm -hmm. in, in the previous studio I was in. Like, it was also part of my job to go back on the old old recordings and and you know try to enhance them in some ways mm. uh, and also remove some defects and this is where it got really interesting for me because I noticed that mm, most of the times even if I I did a great job at you know removing all the the old noises and you know making it a bit wider and bigger and more you know push up a bit more the loudness I, I with with some I took some step backs you know six, seven, eight months later after major restoration productions. And I compared with the originals. And you know what? I still preferred the original. And and it was it was a huge lesson for me because I spent so much time on it. And it's so easy to get high on your own supply. Um, and But I, I noticed that it, in some parts, restoration is definitely useful. You know, sometimes the recording is of, of terrible quality and you have to dust it off. But usually I, I try to respect the the emotion of it. I try to respect the quirks of and the problems of a recording. You know, when an artist drops a pen, I want to hear the sound. You know, when there's a, a small crack in the wood of the space that we're recording it, it, it gives 
you know, it gives more information. Mm. Uh, it gives more humanity. Mm. And in this era <laughs> where everything is fake, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really hard to see the truth from mm. from reality. I I have so much love for the imperfections. Mm. And, and this yeah. is what we're really trying to do also here is like this is what we're why we're recording with old microphones like my main microphones are like uh, rca 44 bx's mm. from the 1950s mm. uh, or old millidom 42 b's from the 40s mm. because with these ribbon microphones you get much less frequencies than the human ear actually needs to understand an emotion mm. you know and so being able to take back this old technology and try to make it a bit more coherent for the present is one of my main missions. It's mm. like yeah. w when you show somebody a picture of a portrait mm. in, you know, 4K, full color, HD, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then you say you show the exact same picture in, in black and white. Yeah. And you ask the, the person, where are the emotions? Yeah. You know, the chances are they're going to say the one in black and white because there's less information and they can focus on what's important. Mm. And so that's what we're trying to do is like black and white, yeah. but in sound. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, I, I, sometimes I, I talk to, um, two of my friends who are photographers about the Leica cameras that restrict the user by only offering black and white mode. And uh, it's kind of a <laughs> comparable discussion. It's also, well, in a way, um, well, two things. First of all, like in the in the early year, recording years, there was just no way around capturing mistakes or capturing noise. The, the noise flow was just so much higher in earlier years, and then you had like yeah. just limited possibilities with your microphones, and then you had these very charismatic players like Glenn Gould who would sing along. Um, when they would have a, a, a Bach recording, you would hear them sing and whistle in the back and, and like actually talk while record. Yeah. And this, yeah, I mean, I mean that, that definitely, I think is a part of the, the atmosphere and the magic of, of these like iconic recordings that you, you hear how the artist is involved and you just not, you know, not just hear the result of it, but actually the, the, you're involved in the, pro in the real process. Um, yeah. Do you do you know? Are you aware of a composer by the name Helmut Lachenmann? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. We recorded one of his pieces a few a few months ago. Oh yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's he's yeah. he's still around, um, living in Italy. And I, when like he was part of the the the, the post Second World War avant garde um, in 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 Germany and in Europe. And um, I think a few of his earlier pieces from the I guess like the late late sixties or the sixties, um, they are based on the idea of um, suppressing the the official tone of an instrument, but actually working with everything that has traditionally been suppressed. Like if you're into an in intonation uh, process of a cello, so to really kind of shape. Uh, all the 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 sounds that are usually unwanted, like click sounds, percussive sounds, um, using yeah. the bow in a different way, you know, knocking on 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 wood of of the instruments as opposed to playing it as as clean as the the, yeah. the tradition uh, is kind of <laughs> laying laying it out. So uh, I was just thinking about this as this, this really really interesting um, thought as well to yeah. to make things imperfect and to create. Uh, uh, um, art from from that kind of mindset. No, I, I I I love this because it's so out of the box. Yeah, uh, we recorded in in a chapel in Paris, uh, Bertrand Chamaillou. Mm -hmm. um, you can check out the album. It's called Good Night, and there's one of his pieces with Lechenman, mm -hmm. and it, it it's so amazing because it's basically it's a an album that is composed around lullabies. And, and, it, and it gets so deep and then you get into a state where you're kind of sleeping with some Bach music and, you know, and at one point in the album, you have some Lechenmann mm -hmm. and it's, it starts with, Papi! you know, and, and the, the, the mixing idea, and we worked a lot with Bertrand, the mm -hmm. pianist on this one, mm -hmm. was to try to um, basically curve the, the first uh, frequencies, the, the first impulses. And then to try to get a bit more resonances that we usually would mm. from a piano. So we did a special mic setup where all the wood vibration, all the 
vibrations from the strings that weren't playing all the harmonics were tr we tried to push it up as most as we could mm -hmm. and the whole piece it was actually constructed around the notes that weren't played oh, okay. and so it was mm -hmm. such a fascinating thing you know and and kudos to him kudos to the composer for mm -hmm. for doing such a you know an experimental work with classical music yeah. like yeah that's pretty cool yeah yeah but, um there's a, also a piece by Ligeti where you have an a string orchestra. It's called Ramifications. It's from mm -hmm. 1968 and was premiered in 69. And you have, so you have base, I think that the orchestra is divided in two parts and um, each part has, uh, uh, and they are uh, permanently one quarter tone apart from each other tuned. Mm -hmm. So everyone, so, so there's this psychological effect where both uh, ensemble sites Uh, have to fight against their will and their like natural instinct to become one. So it's becoming really smeary and yeah. and and there's this 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 beautiful like sound world appearing be because of people trying to you know stick to the score, but at the same time listening to to so many musicians next to them playing like a little bit apart. And um, or with the requiem that was used in Stanley Kubrick's uh, um, um, uh, movies, uh, where you yeah. have huge choirs where everyone has like an ever so slightly different uh, uh, pitch. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just 2001. You just can't perform it the way it's yes. written in the score. So there's the stress and this the psychological effect is kind of invisibly written into the score, yeah. and that makes the music interesting at the end of the day. Now. Yeah. Absolutely. No. Yeah, it, it's cool. when, when you live partly in improvisation or at least some freedom within a classical composition, mm -hmm. this is where it gets super interesting. And, and when you compare different uh, interpretations yeah. of the same symphony, actually, the, you, you can see that the score is not written in stone. You know the yeah the way you can interpret it is so it c can change so dramatically mm. that you know this is this is what classical music is all about and honestly for me it's all about been being trying to push the laziness out of classical music uh, because I do feel that a lot of people always thought that classical music shouldn't change mm. and me coming from electronic and rock and roll music when I got into the industry I was like. This is so boring, <laughs> you know, like it, it's the most beautiful thing ever. Mm -hmm. Like classical compositions have this, you know, emotion that other um, genres don't have and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and, and I think our goal is to try to push it as much as we can. It's a to make huge, it evolve. It's a huge challenge that you're facing, I think. Um, but definitely, it's a great goal. <laughs> but the way <laughs> classical music is, yeah, it's a mission. I mean, the way classical music is presented to the broader audience, and the way it's presented in radio, the way it's presented in 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 its visual representation in in you know LP covers, CD covers, this that that's still the, very much the old way, I think. And in in a way, most time, yeah. And the the program the the programs that you would um, see in most of the the more established orchestras is is usually very old school still. Um, from time to time, you would find like a new piece or a commission to a, a contemporary composer, but. Um, It's yeah. It's I think it's still quite stuck. There's a lot of things that you could actually do to to modernize this this yeah. field. No, I completely agreed. Well, I mean, it, it, for example, what we did recently, like um, we've been we've been developing with Dolby uh, their their latest format, mm -hmm. uh, Dolby Atmos Music. Yeah, uh, for for a year and a half now, and it came out earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, And it's fantastic because we're remixing a lot of uh, things in Atmos. So basically, what is Atmos? It's about having sound all around you. So it, it's super easy when you have, you know, uh, 16 speakers all around and they're super high quality. Yeah, sure, Atmos is great. But we were doing this before, you know, we were doing surround uh, mixing before and surround sounds never really took off as a format. Yeah. And it's because who has... Uh, 64 speakers at home like nobody does no. um, and yeah, at least I don't <laughs> think so 
And what's so great about the new format uh, from Dolby is that it's a modular format. So mm. basically, yeah. you're mixing things and you're putting objects uh, in the space. And then there's a handshake that, that uh, happens. So you have all your objects and then you export a specific, a specific let's say, Atmos format. Mm. And you're going, for example, to send the Atmos format on your phone through a, a streaming app like, you know, Amazon Music. And um, the, 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 the file will basically look at the phone and say, okay, hello phone, what do you have? Do you have like one, two speakers? Or are you on AirPods in binaural? Or are you connected to a huge, you know, uh, surround system? Mm -hmm. And then it's going to adapt to the specific output. Ah, and okay. it gives us mm -hmm. so much more precision and we can finally say that we can give an immersive experience mm. to the people that have AirPods or a headphone no. or a, a surround sound system. Have you and, ever... And we've been, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go on. Sorry. Have you ever experienced um, do, uh, a, a multi-channel Dolby Atmos system and, and had the opportunity to compare it um, against uh, something like an Ambisonics or Wavefield synthesis setup? Um. Well, I, I, I went into, when we were studying the, the Atmos case, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a, an Atmos system here in, in Paris. Finally, oh. we got it certified. Great. So, yay. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had a chance to compare, yeah, with Ambisonic systems. Yeah. And uh, it, it's extremely interesting to see the difference. And I think it's also maybe a very personal uh, thing to judge, but I will do my best. I, I, I do believe that... Um, When you have a multi-channel capacity, it's not a problem to do an immersive sound, whether it's an Atmos or whether it's kind of a, an ambisonic thing. Mm. Um, the real challenge is actually for us to build a system that can actually also uh, redistribute the sound well on different types of system, whether you're in the car, on the phone, or on headphones. Yeah. And so this is for me where th there's really a, a, a difference, you know, this modular adaptation yeah. to the day-to-day -day life. And this yeah. is what the people yeah. want. Okay. You know? mm. What do you think? I mean... Yeah, it's just, um, I think it's permanently evolving. I, I heard like the, in the earlier years, I heard Dolby Atmos systems that I didn't find overly impressive mm. um, or where it still really didn't have this, like, kind of physical 360 degree feel to it but um we are the company is actually 10 minutes away from technical university or five minutes away and so we have very good connections there um and i also studied there so so it's um there's some some family vibes going on between us and the oh, yeah. a couple institutes there so and they do have a, a wave field synthesis um set up mm -hmm. um and This one, uh, when I heard this for the first time, I had a very, I, I had really goosebumps because it, for the first time I had the feeling that it's possible to actually really pinpoint um, musical objects and, and lead them yeah. towards uh, where we want them to be. So it was quite uh, um, mind blowing, but it was also uh, quite sure back in, in those days that it could never be something that can be experienced outside the academic world or outside the scientific yeah. world in a way. So it's, for me, it's really interesting that it becomes more relevant these days to think in, in 360 visuals and 360 audio and to see that, uh, yeah, there, there's attempts to, to bring it into some sort of a mainstream form. And we, we feel that also, but we, we uh, have more Uh, orders, speaker orders that are related to yeah. to surround setups that um, that touch the the idea of uh, of of Dolby Atmos and and com comparable formats. So it's becoming a reality for us uh, to 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 be ready to cater into that world as well. Absolutely. Well, the the concept of objects yeah. is I think this is what changed everything because we when we were at, you know used to do surround sounds. It was mostly mixing four speakers, mm -hmm. but now that the idea is about having objects in a 3D environment and that we can actually remap them depending on the output that people have, I mean, this is super sexy. And, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> to, I mean, to go back to, to your previous question as to how we do 
when we have to record in different setups. And this is the perfect uh, case study because we went to during the, the, the pandemic and we were extremely lucky to be able to do that. Um, we went to record the um, Philharmonic of Strasbourg and it, it's a, a CD that we're producing with Warner and um, it's the second volume of the, the CD that we released uh, later this year. And basically to, for you, you to know the story, it's basically um, us being able to record a whole symphonic orchestra and make it uh, sound great in Atmos, okay? okay? And so the first version was in Abbey Road and then we mix it here at the studio to basically put all the elements as objects. And we released it and it did like 30 million streams in um, I think two months, mm. which is like super rare and just on yeah. one platform, Amazon Music. So now this year we had to do the second version of it in Strasbourg and we went over there and obviously we don't have an Atmos setup and we have to do an Atmos sound only with headphones because you can't bring huge speakers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is where it was great. To, this was actually the first recording I did with the heads. Oh, yeah, um, okay. And they, they were tremendous, uh, I have to say. Like, bravo, because, you know, it, it's, we have to imagine in a binaural mode how it feels in an actual Atmos setup. And you, we needed headphones that can actually emulate speakers, you know, and it was it was absolutely fantastic. You could feel the air between the membrane and also um, the ears, and this kind of freedom that we would have to be able to play sound, we could really feel the difference between back and forth a bit, you know, more than we we could usually do. So yeah. like. Yeah. It, it was you, you need to be able to rely on yeah. speakers like we do, but you also mostly need to be able to rely on headphones that give you a sound that is super straight, you know, yeah. that is, you know. Yeah. I also no I also think that the, the, the spatial qualities of the, of the headphone is uh, this is where it really excels, I think. Um, there's, I mean, it comes with the price of being quite bulky, <laughs> as you can see, but um, it, it, it is all for, for the neck muscles. Yeah, but I mean, the good thing is that most people who consider it to be heavy and to fi actually find it heavy think that we solved the, the headband quite well so that it doesn't really yeah. push too hard. And um, I know from quite a lot of people that really use them on a day to day basis for mastering work. And they they don't complain or they don't tell me. <laughs> it must be one of those. But no, I th I think we figured it out pretty well. And um, but actually, you know, bringing a certain distance between uh, the driver and your ears, um, working on the ear pads, the shape of the ear pads, the material of the ear pads, all this comes together, and it's all relevant for for shaping a, s a specific sonic signature in yeah. a headphone. It's a complicated thing, and it's more compl I mean, it's com complicated. And it's the result of a huge learning curve for me, uh, for for my father, um, for for Dimitri, who's who's uh, an important R and D engineer here in the house. We all weren't um, one hundred percent skilled or experienced to actually make a headphone. It's the the first ever, even for my father, who has been in the in the industry for more than I mean forty years now. Um, he's never really touched. Yeah the 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 uh, headphone project so it's been a, a yeah. really crazy ride for us yeah. oh I, I i i can only imagine how hard it must be to transition between because a headphone is such a different beast than, than a speaker in, in any ways yes it's 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 incredible you know and and i i was used to working with a lot of different types of um of headphones i worked a lot with audizy so i'm yeah. not a stranger to heavy headphones it's not a problem for me um and and actually like the for the heads like the the building quality is is amazing and you when, when you were talking about the headband it's true mm. when you have it on on your head you you in some ways i don't know how you did it but you almost don't feel it and mm. it's quite heavy you know I'm, mm. I'm i'm the first one to recognize that for sure yeah but the fact that we don't have any loose screws yeah. and the fact that actually 
I'm sorry, but I dropped it once and it still survived. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. But this is, this is what's going to happen when you go to recordings uh, across the world. Um, the, the thing that is the most important is to be able to rely on a reference uh, listening. Yeah. And I don't care if it's heavy. Uh, I don't think it, it personally is super heavy. Mm. I think it, it, it's quite hefty, but sure. the building quality is good and it allows us to be comfortable when we use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, a, another note on the recording. So we, we do record it and I, I obviously have to judge if it's like the, the right quality and if we're going in the right direction. But what is also super important is to reassure the artist about the, the sonic quality so that they can focus on the interpretation. Yeah. And at, at the beginning of my career, maybe this is one of the points where, you know, uh, gear that might be a bit less, I would say maybe expensive or, or like lesser quality, it doesn't work because you, were, you might do a great recording and then the artist might come over and you're going to put a pair of horrible headphones mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, oh, this is super high, this is not reality. Mm. And and what headphones like these does is that they represent the true reality of what you're creating, the mm. philosophy mm. Uh, that you're creating. And then when the artist sits down, he puts those huge things on and they're always like, oh, what is this? You know, it's like, it's huge. Ah, oh, Mickey Mouse. And, and, and they, they sit down and then they listen to the sound and they can actually focus on the music that they're doing. You know, and that's the most important thing for, for me. If they don't say, oh, it sounds amazing, it, it's a good thing for me because they didn't even notice that we were creating something. It, it seems natural. So that's, that's the ultimate goal, making the artist focus on their composition and not worrying about the sound. So yeah, you yeah. need these kind of things at the same time, you know. Now yeah, that's, that's, of course, also the, the speaker approach here. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to, to not hype anything. We're trying to get closer to the to the source and closer to the truth. Uh, you never really get there because it's always always a deri deri derivation if anything yeah. goes through the speaker. But um, we're well aware of that. But then, of course, um, I mean, one of the the biggest reasons for us to come out with a new series to just just um, announced last week a new series of sp studio monitors that are actually DSP powered because yes. um, for, for mainly two reasons. Firstly, because we always thought that face uh, is something that a loudspeaker company uh, in the 21st century should definitely address. It's not been addressed by many companies to, to actually deal with um, time related problems uh, in, mm -hmm. in a speaker. So um, in order to fully correct the face, we thought it would, and, and to have a, a kind of a latency that is not totally over the moon. Um, this was one of the reasons why we thought we should look into DSPs and just be, not be um, scared and just do blind tests and just really compare um, analog versus digital. Is there anything um, going on? Is there, is, is it a cliche? Is what, what's going on with the whole idea of um, digital being, cold and <laughs> unemotional <laughs> so so we went through that first phase and then we applied like um, this linearizer technology and we brought it into the speakers to make them fully face you know coherent uh, through the entire uh, frequency spectrum and the second thing is that um, uh, a few years ago we uh, came out with this huge analog tower main system it's like a, a mastering main uh, main uh, monitoring system that is made of different components. And it's uh, the special thing about it that makes it different to a lot of uh, main monitoring systems is, is that it's actually fully closed. So it's an infinite baffle. There are no ports anywhere. And the sound of that tower kind of, you know, made us rethink a lot of uh, future <laughs> plans because the, the, the tightness, the realism, mm -hmm. the, the just everything about it sounded so much better than, than uh, a ported main monitors in our opinion that we thought we should really try and bring some of that into uh, the the speaker lines the the monitoring speaker lines so and that's why we came out with the the idea of um creating plugs that you can put into the yes. base ports and then actually have a specific dedicated tuning to to make the speaker a closed port design so you have actually two 
traditions, um, I, I don't want to say philosophies, but two, two traditions of speaker design uh, in, in one box. And all this is only possible because you have to, because you have a DSP platform, a very powerful DSP platform. And, but that's, that was the starting point. It's, it's all about getting a little closer with every step, with every model to get a little bit closer to a, a, um, a great accuracy and, and precision and to re ultimately realism. No, I, I when when I saw the the new speakers, I was so excited because actually, exactly what you just said. These are the main issues that are most of the time never resolved by ordinary speakers, and we do now, I think, start to have the technology where we can actually work on the phasing, and it, it's extremely frustrating when I, I I I'm the first to understand the 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 necessity of the right placement and right sonic treatment within a room. But you need this additional step, I think, in order for you to tune perfectly the system for a specific room. Mm -hmm. And and I'm very frustrated when I go, you know, behind speakers and I'm like, there's nothing to play with. Yeah. And and yeah, just this uh, plug thing. I was like, ah, yes, like, you know, I want to try that. <laughs> because yeah, if it's but... the same ph philosophy, then, then the headphones, I'm like, yeah. it kind of totally makes sense. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we the, the first review units or the first review yeah. magazines that the, will test the speakers, they will receive actually two pairs uh, because I want them to switch between open and closed instantly so they don't have mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of, you know, get 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 them in, get them out, compare, and then that's three minutes. You, you're forgetting some of the impressions that you had. So, so they will have the closed version and a ported version side by side and then can just switch back and forth to actually perceive uh, what we consider to be uh, you know magical in a way so it's um, i'm really looking forward to receiving the first feedback we're just building and building and building these days um, next to that wall basically and um, mm -hmm. and in january we will uh, receive the first kind of outside opinions and of course i hope that they will be great you know out uh, of I'm out sure of all will. the things <laughs> Out of all the things you said, like where was there a transition between um, Mono Company and SoundX? Were some of the 3D related things that you said connected to that kind of company? How do they differ? Maybe we can also clear that up. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so the 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 original story for 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 SoundX was that I was um, recording Mahler Third Symphony in wow. in, uh, in Perm, so it's like a super cold place. It was minus thirty five. But this is where Theodor Kerensis was with his orchestra, Musica Eterna. Mm. And it's honestly one of the best orchestras in the world. And um, we were recording the finale. And, and Theodor asked me to go in, in the right in the middle of the orchestra to put a microphone. And so I went there to put the microphone. As I was on a chair. And then they all started playing together the, the finale. And it was so powerful, you yeah. know. And so yeah. it, it just basically gets you from all the sides. And I was right next to the brass section. I mean, it was extremely, it was an out of this world experiment, you know. And um, I, I noticed something because I never felt so small. And I noticed that I I was feeling everything, but I wasn't hearing anything because the sound pressure was too high, mm. you know. Mm. And I was like, hmm, maybe there's something to do on that. And so I spent the, the, the next seven years to try to create uh, basically an algorithm and some hardware to be able to translate music in real time for deaf people and and once i had this uh um, this first prototype we went to the engs which is the french institute for young deaf kids in paris ah. which is kind of a worldwide reference because it was the first one that was created in 1600s 1700s and then they expanded different uh, schools for deaf people around the world and um i told them i, I have this prototype that that basically remaps the whole spectrum and takes all the important information like melodies, emotions, and, and tries to remap it within um, the spectrum that deaf people can actually feel. And we created a prototype also that looks like a cushion um, that you can basically put in, uh, on your back. And, and that also helps um, guide the AI, because we have an AI inside uh, within, um, to, to work uh, for the deaf people. And so we tried it and it was a, a great success with the, the kids over there and the professors, mm. which also wanted to use it for, for their classes. 
And I, I needed a structure that was designed uh, specifically for research on that project oh, okay. and, and on sonic projects too. So um, I created SoundX, which is basically, uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge um, Elon, Ma Elon Musk fan. <laughs> and, and so he created SpaceX. I was like, ah, you know, it's a tribute. Here's a SoundX. I see. Um, because, uh, uh, yeah, the idea was to create something that was working for inclusivity. And so we, I, I was very happy to be able to, to create that company for that project. We should be ready for deployment uh, summer 2021. Mm. Uh, and the idea is to equip. We already have discussions and we already have classes with different institutes where they're using it for, um, for speech uh, uh, lessons and music lessons too. Because for us, um, it, it, it's, let's say, evident the difference between je and te, mm. but for deaf people, it's extremely complicated because they don't have any feedback. Mm. So that's what we're also trying to um, uh, put forward is that maybe the, like, there might be a better comprehension mm. of these frequencies. And yeah. as you might imagine, we, we also have to work a lot with bass frequencies and, and we also have to work sometimes a lot with bass frequencies within institutes where you can't really do a lot of noises uh, because, you know, it, it's it's a special area and, you know, you cannot blast subs everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so this is also where um, headphones come, come in. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, uh, the, the heads were an, an amazing tool so far because I've rarely felt that much precision out of the, the subs within a headphone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and to be able to mix without a subwoofer is really important for us. Yeah, and and the heads definitely helped yeah. in, in that project with Soundex yeah. for for deaf people. So thank you because it, it's been uh, a tremendous uh, help for us. Great, that's really really great to hear. Um, getting the bass right was one of the biggest challenges in the headphone, and uh, it's one of the reasons yeah. why we opened up this old principle of the um, air motion transformer tweeters. Uh, and we we had to make a more complex version of that. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to create a flat frequency response and to get as as low as the headphone finally now goes um yeah. side note on elon musk um the <laughs> headphone was i think was it chris uh, but it was called the cyber truck of headphones recently oh, yeah. <laughs> i thought that's a really great way of putting it because once you see it yeah. you just you know it's so obviously <laughs> other uh, the design is so different and it's so um just so big and and crazy that uh, yeah, no, yeah. no well, one ever I, forgets it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have pre-ordered the heads if, if I yeah, could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So um, yeah. w what's next for you? Maybe we can uh, you can uh, make a final note on, on your next projects. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so we're, we're developing as much as we can with Dolby, uh, mm -hmm. their new format. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in discussions with different uh, majors and different artists to be able to also work in Atmos with them because I, I personally do feel that this is the next big thing. I, I honestly believe that uh, stereo over the years will gradually be phased out like mono was. And uh, like we have a lot of time before that happens, but... The future will be immersive, uh, whether we like it or not, but it already is. You know, when you go watch something on Netflix or when you play video games or whatever, it's already mixed and, and based on an object uh, a philosophy. And so I, I do believe music is following the same path. We have the results that kind of shows it, mm. but there's a lot of work to do still. So we're, we're going to try our best to uh, promote it and, and do uh, reference productions. Uh, on it. Um, in the future, we, we're also having some uh, TV concepts that we're uh, basically producing. We have this show called The One Mic Sessions, and it's basically a show where we record a whole band with just one microphone, and they have to adapt everything to one microphone at the same time. And so it, it's fascinating to see. Uh, we're actually doing this with Arte. Uh, which is a French and, and German German channel. Well known, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's called the One Mike Tales. If you want to check it out on on Google, we we've done two episodes so far, and we're going to uh, continue as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. And I also have a a third, let's say, 
path, which is um, Russia. So I, I, I'm the sound director for a space called Guest 2, mm -hmm. um, which will open uh, in 2021. And uh, it's basic, it's done by Renzo Piano, the architects. So I'm working uh, closely with him and his team in order to design uh, all the sonic structures within this space. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a big Centre Pompidou mm -hmm. uh, for the arts. So it's a big exhibition place with concert halls and, and uh, amazing spaces for people to live in uh, musically and artistically. And so and it's it's right next to the Kremlin in Moscow. And um, it, we, we're trying to make it an open street. So, so the idea is that we, we would also put Moscow on the map of international productions, whether it's, you know, mixing, mastering or whatever, but also mostly artistic creations, mm -hmm. concerts, exhibitions, etc. And it, it's a fascinating space to, uh, to be working in. So that's uh, another project that we're trying to push forward. And we're working with other cool brands like El Acoustic and, and Dolby on, on that project, too. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and finally, also in 2021, to be able to uh, finalize this project for for deaf people that we have. Uh, this is kind of my main um, work uh, because it, it's uh, it's one thing to be able to do great productions, uh, and I feel honored whenever I do. But it's it's another thing when we can actually uh, work in innovation for inclusivity mm -hmm. and try to you know bring people that weren't used to coming to concerts, even to recordings, and, and try to make them understand the experiments and uh, understand the emotions that are linked to that. So it's basically trying to put families together mm. um, f so that they could, you know, feel the same things and live the same moments. Yeah. So yeah. this will be the, the main focus of 2021 to try to finalize this, um, this push. Really, really nice. Uh, it's been so interesting. I hope you can make it over to Berlin or maybe I can, if I'm in Paris, we should meet in person at one point. <laughs> You're Absolutely. always welcome I in mean, the company. I would love to show you around one, yes. one time. And, yeah, oh, um, it would be amazing. We make that happen Please, next year. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome here. And yeah, as soon as I come to Berlin, I'll, I'll drop you a message. Great. Hopefully very soon. Great. Thank you so much for today. This was really, really great and very interesting. Um, I'm I'm very yeah. happy to 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 do this interview with you, and yeah, going to absolutely. Well, I, I just soon. like to say thank you for for your work. I mean, it, it's been such a, a a privilege to to be able to test out the the heads in in the past few months. It has helped us a lot, and it kind of opened my eyes on on what I was doing wrong with certain mixes. Mm -hmm. And I love to be uh, proven wrong. That's a, one of the best feelings. Like, ah, this mix is terrible. And I remember having to redo the entire mix um, that I did for Bertrand Chamayou, actually, the, the Good Night, mm -hmm. um, because I felt that the basses weren't as precise as they should have been. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to get floppy basses on, on a piano. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, and, and congratulations, and all my wishes and luck for for the new uh, speaker sets that um, that you've released. I'm super curious. Goodbye, thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. Ciao. Bye.